We live in a capitalist economy, which means that all goods and services are traded by private concerns for profit. This trade is regulated by the state, ideally in contemporary politics with as little state intervention as possible. According to the political economic theory of Karl Marx, all objects or commodities that are traded within this economy have a labour value, a use value and an exchange value. Labour is the time and effort it takes to make the object. Use value is the object's ability to meet set human needs. Basically, what can you do with the object? How much can you do with it? And exchange value is the desirability of the object when compared to other objects on the market. Once a commodity is sold, the difference between the exchange value and the use value is the surplus value or profit. Surplus value equals exchange value minus use value. Marx identified that the difference between use value and exchange value in any given commodity is the cause for social friction. It's obvious someone is laboring for someone else's profit. So the art market, however, starts to mess with these values prescribed to commodities because an art object can be invested with a very high exchange value and have a very low use value. For instance, a Picasso painting, which looks great, but won't help you nail a picture on a wall. This is why we say that the arts are revolutionary or have revolutionary potential. Marx himself would be wary of this statement though, by pointing out that the middle class are happy to break with their own economic or cultural principles, so long as that that break can be used for financial gain or to make a buck. Indeed, art and music history are abundant with movements where people break out of the economic mould of the time to be free for a moment only to be recaptured again, to have their work turned to profit. Indeed, this very cyclical movement is part of the job of the creative arts within a late capitalist or consumer economy like ours. The Composer-musician's relationship though to his or her labour is a bit different from that of the visual artist. Having first undertaken that labour for someone, for example a commissioning body like a uh, recording company or a conferring institution, the composer-musician gets to own a portion of the commodity which they have laboured over and can then make some profit through further sales, that is through royalties. This is the equivalent of a road worker being to being paid to fill in a pothole and then being allowed to collect a toll each time a car drives over it. However, unlike Picasso and the road worker, strictly speaking the composer musician has no object to sell because music is an immaterial art form. You play the song and then it disappears into thin air, non-economic value par excellence. Performing rights associations were set up to address precisely this problem of how to pay composers for something that was immaterial or does not exist. For example, Sassem in France in 1851. Then in the second half of the 19th century, music scores were sold to people so that they could take them home and play them on their pianos. A print technology which was then eclipsed by a series of recording technologies in the 20th century, such as you know, shellac, vinyl, cassette, CD. Further increasing profits for composers and makers of music. Importantly, these commodities, printed music and recordings, could be stockpiled in order to maximise their exchange value. Music no longer vanished into thin air. Today, if boutique purchasing of vinyl, t-shirts and other types of merchandise are put to one side, internet streaming has again disrupted the conventional profit flows to composer musicians that were typical of the 20th century and it's now antiquated technologies. Indeed, one could even argue that post-scored and post-recorded music has returned to its mercantile and troubadour-esque roots where there is no object to sell anymore. In other words, music for the internet is what light is to homeowners with solar panels. You produce it to consume it. Certainly, Outside the classical concert hall and high-end film productions where the term composer still holds some kind of cultural significance, without any object to sell, 
The very term composer seems to us largely redundant or old hat. The professional occupations of composer, producer, DJ or composer, musician, arranger where products and services are sale in combination are indicative of this trend. Furthermore, particularly at the top end of town at least, ticket sales from stadium or concert hall touring are becoming an important source of revenue, perhaps more important than recorded objects. But let's leave these romantic non-economic virtues such as troubadours or post-apocalyptic free improvising drum circles with no audience for another time. In my own work as a composer, I am well aware that much of my music making is viable through state subsidy, where some government agencies, for now at least, still have the good grace and forethought not to outsource my labour or their budget to a private contractor who would do it twice as badly for double the price.